Is that what it is? Oh, okay. I was asking Chris, I was like, what is that sound? It's like, there's light bulbs turning on. Okay, cool. Now I understand what that, I didn't know the whole sermon series. I was like, what is that sound? Like take joy, but like it's lights. Anyway, sorry. Hi, everybody. Matt Holtzman, one of the assisting pastors here at First Pres, honored to be here with you all today as we um, celebrate at the Lord's table and as we come and heed his word here this morning. Let me pray for us before we head into this passage together. Jesus, we pray now that as we look to your word, your Holy Spirit would speak to us. You would speak powerfully to us. Uh, Show us your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus, and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, friends, I am uh, here to start the sermon here on the Joy with Friends with a game. Okay, we're gonna play a game together. How many of you guys have ever played a game? At the, and all the young life people in the house said, oh boy. Um, but this is gonna require you to team up a little bit with those that are around you. This is a togetherness passage. We're gonna start with the togetherness exercise. Are we ready? Yep. Yes, we are. Okay, we're gonna do it anyway. So team up if you can with those around you. And this is what you're gonna do. It's nothing too hard, but if, if I, when I ask these questions, a little quiz and you know the answer as a, as a partner, just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. If you don't just keep your hand down. That's it. It's easy, right? Okay. Here we go. First question, teaming up. Yeah. Raise your hand. If you know who won the Heisman trophy last year, last year. Nope. Okay. Next two. Next question. Raise your hand. If you can name who won the Miss America contest last year. I I don't think there's any hands up, are there? One? There was one? No? Okay. Nope, nope. They withdraw that. It's like, I think, nope, nope. Okay. Question number three. Raise your hand if you know who won the Nobel Peace Prize last year. Any of them? (laughs) Zero. You guys did stellar on that test. Good job. Lucky for you, there's... (laughs) Lucky for you, there is part two to the quiz, okay? We're almost done. Are you ready? All right. Raise your hand if you can name a teacher or a coach that impacted your life for the good. Ooh, we're doing better. Now raise your hand if you can name one person you enjoy spending time with. Oh, okay. Last one. Is that person sitting right next to you? Next question. Raise your hand. If you can name a friend who has helped you through a very difficult time. Okay, good. Boy, you did a lot better on that second part of the test. Good job. Here's the point. I think you're already picking up on it here as we enter in, into this time together. Um, when all is said and done, the people who have mattered the most to us over the course of our lives are not those who made yesterday's headlines. The people who matter the most to us, the ones that have impacted our lives the most are those who have cared for us the most genuinely. And maybe those that we have cared for most genuinely. It's true, isn't it? For today, we are actually gonna be talking about the joy with friends. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. Friendship. Man, it matters, doesn't it? We live in a world where friendship is just a prime thing for us. We need it. Having the right kind of people in our lives can increase a sense of joy in our, in our lives. A fun translation I found of Proverbs 27, nine says this, a sweet friendship replenishes the soul and awakens the heart for joy. That's Proverbs 27. Think about it. Who are the people in your life that you might consider soul replenishing relationships? Soul replenishing. Now I can hear some of my introverted friends that are here right now, you know, that it's like, man, they brought an extroverted pastor up here to talk about friendship and connection and let's get together. And we're gonna start singing, we are the world real quick or something real quick. Get me out of here. In fact, the last thing I need is more people time. I would rather you leave me alone, Mr. Pastor. Leave me by myself. I came here to sit in a dark room by myself. Don't make me play a game. (laughs) I want to be left alone. Maybe some people are in the house like that. And if you're kind of like, 
You know, my, my wife would actually say, being the mother of three teenage boys, that everybody needs alone time, you know, from time to time. Amen? We all need alone time from time to time. But you know, a life of alone is just no good. In fact, we're not designed for that. When God created us, he didn't put that in our DNA to say, have at it, you're on your own. No, he said it is not good for man to be alone. And so we got to pay attention to that. In today's day and age, man, we are a people starved for the real thing, aren't we? Loneliness, isolation. I mean, it's at epidemic proportions. You don't have to have me tell you that. Many of you guys are probably experiencing a little bit of that here even today. There's an emptiness of the heart that actually settles in whenever we don't have these kinds of connections. And it's no surprise to us because did you know really the, the, the definition of friendship has really been hijacked for us. There's cheaper alternatives that are promised now through an array of social media avenues. And you can be a mile wide as far as quantity, but just a millimeter thick when it comes to quality. We need this kind of connection. It is at the very core of who we are. It's, it's who we're designed to be. Knowing one another deeply beneath the superficial layers that oftentimes we only get from one another. Caring for one another in a very genuine way. That's what we're gonna talk about today. That's the nature of the friendship that God wants for us. And the apostle Paul knew this, and while he certainly had many friends that partnered in his ministry, today we're gonna to look at two treasured friends of his, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, how many of you guys have heard of Timothy? This is the last time I'll, <laughs> I'll ask you to raise your hand, okay? Now, how many of you guys have heard of Epaphroditus? Yeah, not as many, right? You're like, who is that? It sounds kind of weird. Um, you'll hear more about these two in just a second, but what I wanna do right now is catch you up a little bit in our sermon series so that you can kind of know where we're landing in the word. Up to this point in the letter, Paul has been building this picture of what it looks like to be united in Christ. Everybody say that, united in Christ. As his people, we are bound to him but we are also bound to one another. And when we're in Christ, there's a, there's a bond there. We sang the song down the hall today, blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. I don't think we're singing that one in, in here today. It'd be a good one at some point, you should learn it. Um, but that is really what it means to be united in Christ. And because of that, there's a behavior that needs to come with that that Paul points to. We heard this last week. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. Paul says, hey guys, you know what? Being selfish or proud, those things cannot dwell in the same house as humility and valuing others above yourselves. They, there's just no room for them. Looking to the interests of others and being able to think about others, that is what I'm looking for, says the Apostle Paul. In fact, in verse five, he points to Jesus saying, hey, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Well, what was he thinking about? Well, he, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a, what? Servant. So Jesus, our perfect example of what humility looks like, of what other, being others oriented looks like. This is the one Paul wants us to be able to focus on because it's in that example where we learn to humble ourselves and to be able to thinking about others. So that's where Paul was. And then we get to this passage here today, which I'm so grateful for my friend Jim who read it here a moment ago. I don't know if you heard it, but it sounds a little bit like a travel log or something. It's a little boring. Paul kind of goes into it and it's this, hey, I hope to send you Timothy. I'm gonna be happy when he makes it there. Oh, hey, by the way, Epaphroditus is probably gonna be on your way. And oh, he almost died. And oh, you know, it's kind of like, What's, what's happening here? You know, it seems a little strange, but there's nothing in God's word that's, that's an accident. 
for being there. Everything has a purpose. And what I want you guys to think about today is how Timothy and Epaphroditus, Paul is putting those before us as role models. And what I want you all to think about today are two questions as we enter into this passage. First question is, who are the role models in your life? We're talking about friends, but we're really talking about role models, okay? Show me your friends and I'll show you your future, as the saying goes. But then the second question is, what kind of role model is God calling you to be? What is the character qualities that he's wanting to develop in you? Because... The thing is, guys, we are leading someone somewhere at some time. You're being watched. We are being watched. And what kind of role model does God desire for us to become? So those are the two important questions I want you guys to have on your mind as we go into this passage. Let's start with Timothy. So who is Timothy? Timothy is a young man, probably between the age of 18 and 22. Now, are there any base campers here in our house? Base campers, you were just upstairs for a little bit of time. And you went to lunch, apparently. <laughs> That's okay. Well, anyway, if, if there were base campers here, you would know that probably Timothy would be hanging out with them if, uh, if he was here in Presbyterian land. And Paul met Timothy on his first missionary journey through Asia Minor and would grow up to be Paul's protege. He learned from Paul and walked in his ways. But he, Timothy was the son of a Jewish woman and, a, and then also a Gentile father. He had that going on in his makeup. So you can imagine the persecution that Timothy may have had going on as well in his life. But here, Timothy actually comes in and gets to know Paul in one of Paul's earlier uh, parts of his first mission. And Timothy comes to give his life to the Lord uh, as his, and, and sees him as his Lord and Savior. And as such, he becomes, Paul, he becomes part of Paul's team and goes on all these other mission trips with Paul all throughout his secondary journey. And so Paul and Timothy, you can imagine, if you've ever been on trips together, you get to know one another in a pretty significant way. And Paul is saying, man, it's time to send somebody back to the church in Philippi. I'm choosing Timothy. And this is what he says about him. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Now watch this. I have no one else like him who will show what? Genuine concern for your welfare. Genuine concern. Wow, what a statement. You know, there's a big difference, isn't there, between concern and genuine concern. Big difference. It's kind of like leather and genuine leather, <laughs> right? When I was in high school, I had a leather wallet that lasted about three weeks. You know, I would have done better to just carry everything around in a Ziploc bag. I mean, it was just dilapidated, fell apart, I threw it away. But then before I went into college, right as I was going into college, my dad gave me a genuine leather wallet. And this wallet actually lasted me all throughout my college career, which I was very grateful for because I was on the five-year plan and I needed something to last me that long. Genuine leather. Here's the point. To be genuinely concerned for one another. This is not a flash in the pan or something that is short-lived or fickle. To be genuinely concerned with our brothers and sisters, that is something that is loyal and loving and long lasting. It's something that's gonna be there for the long haul, genuine concern. That's the kind of concern, that's the kind of quality in Timothy that he's wanting to send back now to, to the church in Philippi and Timothy can bring it. Now I wanna pop out of this and just ask in our context here right now, get, get yourself to think about a little bit about our context. Can you imagine the marriage where husband and wife aren't merely tolerating one another anymore, but they are giving themselves over to the power of the Holy Spirit in such a way to where they are growing in this sense of being genuinely concerned for one another. I see some marriages that have lasted throughout many, many years of maybe what that looks like. It's a beautiful thing to behold. Can you imagine a family where 
you know, they're just able to slow down long enough, put the phones down just long enough for them to be able to see one another to where they're finally being able to be genuinely concerned. Father to son, mother to daughter, grandparents in the mix. What does it look like for us to just, <laughs> parents, just for a second, put the phone down and be genuinely concerned with what your kid is saying? Kids, to be able to put your phone down and think about maybe dad has something to offer me. He's, I think he's genuine about what he's saying. We got to be genuinely concerned about these things. What about us as a church, First Press? Where no matter who you are or where you come from or what you're dealing with in this room, no matter what you walked in with today, you could rest assured that the brothers and sisters here at First Pres are going to be meeting you with a genuine concern about who you are and where you come from. So much so that in turn, you also will be genuinely concerned for them. Are we that kind of church today? Do we wanna be that kind of church today? Amen. May the Lord do his work in us to where this might be able to be done more and more in us. And Paul knew that this really was an uphill climb. Um, he would write in another letter, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this one, it's okay, you can bring it up now. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Uh-oh, <laughs> we got a problem. Sin's a big deal. Uh, Junior, one of our uh, pastors here, she's always going around. Junior's saying, I am the center of my own universe. <laughs> you know? Which is really funny. If you, if you knew Junior, it's not an accurate statement at all. Junior's one of the most selfless, just others-oriented woman I know on the, on the face of this campus. She's amazing. But t yeah, for Junior. Love it. Love it. And Paul's kind of seeing that in Timothy, you know, he's saying, now remember Timothy, you know that Timothy has proved himself because, and watch this, as a son with his father, a son with his father, you see the love there? This is a kindred connection. Paul sees him as a son with the father. This is someone who's learning from someone who's older. There's a close connection there. He has served with me in that way in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So there's Timothy, Paul's holding him up. A family member, a, fa a faithful servant, one who is genuinely concerned for the needs of others. And Paul's saying, hey, you wanna grow in your ability to be genuinely concerned? Look at Timothy. There is no one like him, he says. It's a helpful picture for us here at First Pres. It's a helpful picture. We're a big church and sometimes we can miss one another, can't we? Um, I remember 14 years ago when I got here, I walked through these big open doors and saw the big bridge and Jesus was in the middle and I was like, oh my gosh, this place is a monstrosity. And I remember the first time I walked in here just kind of being clammed up a little bit of just kind of thinking, I don't think I'm gonna last here that long. I'm kind of feeling like I'm walking to a mall, you know, or something. I've had that sense coming from a very smaller church <laughs> where I came from Lubbock, Texas. This was just overwhelming. But then it was in this very room where I came across Dick and Mary Freak, who continue to be very, very dear friends of mine, uh, who asked me about my family, where I was coming from, what I was doing there, and, I, and just was, was wondering more about my life. And it was in that interaction where I actually sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. Isn't it amazing how you can sense the Spirit of the Holy, you can sense the Holy Spirit's presence through the presence of others and the interaction of others? That's a, God, or, God put that in the blueprints of us. It's kind of an amazing thing. May we continue to develop our ability to be genuinely concerned with one another, friends. Church isn't church unless we do. Amen? Okay, well, that's a little bit of Timothy. Let's look at Epaphroditus. I'm gonna fly through Epaphroditus. Now, we don't know a whole lot about him other than his name is really hard to spell, but we do know a few of these things. Epaphroditus was actually a man from Philippi. He was from this congregation that Paul's writing to. And we know that he was sent to Paul in Rome to, with a financial gift and this, this really deserves a little bit of time here, and I don't want to take too much time, but it's worth it. Um, 
so Paul is in Rome, Epaphroditus is in Philippi before arriving. And the church is saying, let's send Paul a financial gift. We know that Epaphroditus delivered that gift later because we hear about it in the, in the letter. Um, this is not like walking to Manitou Springs, okay? Um, which is pretty far. But going from Philippi to Rome is 800 miles away. Yeah. Now, we don't learn this in the text. I think Epaphroditus was a stud. I think he was physically fit to be able to make this journey and for the Philippian church to be able to say, okay, we're going to send you a bag of cash. You got to guard this on your way. I mean, I just, we don't read it, but I'm just imagining Epaphroditus kind of being this, like, yeah, I I can take it, you know, (laughs) I can take it. (laughs) Again, a Matt Holtzmanism. I'm sorry. Let's get back to the word. Um, Verse 25, this is how Paul thinks about him though. And listen to, listen to this. But I think it is necessary to send back to you now, Paphroditus. Watch this, my brother, coworker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. And here's why Paul wants to send him back. For he longs for all of you. And he's distressed because you heard he was ill. Oh, indeed he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. You hear the care there? This is close friendship. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Paul just wants to get rid of Epaphroditus so that he's not... Just like, God, we got to get you back so everybody stops worrying about you. There's this really relational connection that's going on here. Now, I want to take a look at these three words that Paul describes him as. My brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. He's my brother. Again, like Timothy, a family word. Timothy is like a son with his father. But Epaphroditus, man, he's like a brother. There's this kindred connection, this close family-like bond that Paul knows with Epaphroditus. This is close, not some cog in the wheel. This is a really close connection, my brother. Second is coworker. For Paul, this is someone who is working side by side, co-laboring for the advancement of the gospel. Y'all may have heard Tim, maybe in uh, in the meeting that we had last week of how important the advancement of the gospel is for us as a church. It was very near and dear to Paul as well. And Paul knew how, I mean, Paul even expressed how near and dear this was for him in the opening chapter of this letter when he said, man, I thank my God for you guys every single time I remember you. But why? It's because of your partnership in the gospel that he talks about. Co-worker, that's Epaphroditus. And Paul sees him that way. Finally, fellow soldier. Well, what's a soldier? Some of you soldiers in the room could kind of help me with this, but I think about my my grandfather who fought in World War II. And he would always say to me, you know, a soldier is a servant first. That's what he would say. We have different pictures of what soldier in our mind might be, but it's a servant first. I like to think of a, of a soldier as someone who is familiar with sacrifice, who wakes up thinking about the interests of others out ahead of their own interest. Someone who's willing to serve and sacrifice even to the point of giving up their own life for the life of others and for the love of others. Epaphroditus had this kind of spirit in him. In fact, we don't really know when Epaphroditus fell ill, but we do know that he served so devotedly in the partnership and the advancement of the gospel that he almost lost his life for it. And Paul is so, so Grateful for who he is. Epaphroditus was all in. Paul is so touched by who he is that he writes, so then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy. (laughs) After all, he just walked 800 miles. Welcome that guy. (laughs) And honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me our 800 mile marathoner. Paul calls my brother, my coworker, my fellow soldier. Do you know people like this in your life? It's, it's rare, it's rare. 
but they're there. Maybe a better question for us today is this. Is that the kind of person you might be able to be formed into? What would it look like for God to form these things in us that we would wanna be so others oriented that we would be willing to give anything for our brothers and sisters? Timothy and Epaphroditus, there they are. Just two friends of Paul, but two exemplary role models for us as we open his, his word and consider these things. You know, as we approach the Lord's table, and I just want to beeline for that. Near band, I don't know if you're coming back out or whatever. I think John's coming up here too to help with the table. I want you guys to think about this as we enter into the Lord's Supper together. Jesus, on the night that he celebrated this meal with his, with his friends, um, he was there and he did some very highly relational things with them. Talked about things of old, probably they were telling stories about maybe what had happened, who knows. But he washes their feet and he talks about love and he talks about how he wants them to act because soon he's leaving, he's gonna be leaving them. They don't quite understand this. But one of the things is they're walking out from dinner. Jesus says these things. He says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. It's a nice statement. We may have seen that in Hobby Lobby or something. <laughs> but then two verses later after that, and this is where I want you guys to really pay attention, especially as you come to partake of Christ's body and his blood broken for you. We got to personalize the word of God sometimes. Jesus would say this, and I almost imagine him taking your cheeks and looking you right in the eyeballs and saying, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. Friends, we've talked about Timothy and Epaphroditus, all good things. I'm gonna give you some homework at the end of the time here before the benediction that you're gonna to wanna to take with you. But as we go into this moment together, I want you to be cognizant of the fact that the holy God of the universe who created you, who ordained all of life and where all of life flows from, did not consider himself so important that he would just be aloof and far away from you, but he became like us so that you might be saved, so that you might not have just life for this life that we live, but eternal life for the one to come. But even more than that, he calls you his friend. That should really stop us in our tracks. And I want you to think about that as you receive the elements here today. You are a friend of God. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your love to us. We thank you, Lord, that you've redeemed us and called us as your sons and daughters. Lord, we thank you for these examples of Epaphroditus and Timothy and how your word speaks to us, Lord, in, in the most wonderful of ways. But now, Lord, prepare us to meet you here at this table, um, not just merely as a servant, but as your friend. Help us hear your voice, Lord. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.